Diagnosticism in general, I, I say don't do it. Uh, pick one, put a ring on it. But what we find generally is that CIOs they don't want to, to do that because they're not really experts in any one cloud, so they want to hedge, they want to go to all clouds. Now that falls on the security group.
so one of the, uh, the things that we see are cur uh, developers not knowing that something is a credential. Uh, so if you've used like Azure uh, connection strings, they're this kind of long, not really opaque string, but they don't necessarily look like a key or an API key right away, but they completely are. They contain the endpoint and all the connection information to connect to it. Uh, and so that's a real issue. And if you know what you're looking at, you might accidentally publish that somewhere. You thought it was private, it's public, whatever. Um, that's, that part is old news. Uh, what is, is still happening, though, is people are logging in. And if you think about what I was talking about, that top of the pyramid, the, an, the analytics, that's your one shot at finding this, is if that credential is sitting out there somewhere on, you know, it might even be sort of a, like a partner, like you shared a website with a partner, not even really public. Um, the, if they find that and they use the credentials and they log in, you're, you're now really just looking for a credential theft. All right, so how are we going to mitigate this? So the email's pretty obvious, right? You're going to try to prevent phishing, block any malicious doc you can. And this is uh, the cloud side, by the way. Uh, the endpoint, I mean, same stuff, right? Trying to just protect the endpoint and all, the, all that's involved there. Uh, from the network perspective, uh, I've talked to a lot of companies that are using VDI now, so beyond Citrix, and that's happening quite a bit. And what I'm shocked by are most companies aren't doing things like network security monitoring in front of VDI. So they have a lot less visibility than they would have if they were running that on-prem. They just It's not that you can't do it, they just basically forget to do it. And you even find places that are running VDI without an endpoint agent at all. Uh, so they don't have any kind of, you know, basic protections there. Uh, they just assume, well, if anything happens, we'll just wipe the box. O okay, that is a lot easier in VDI, and you can still wipe the box, but the credential's stolen. You can't unwipe the credential, uh, not without knowing about it. Uh, so network's still very uh, relevant. But the real, the real meat here is the detecting the, the credential theft and any compromised assets that are already out there. And that's generally going to be through analytics. All right, so let's look at a couple of specific scenarios. Is this meme still relevant? I love this meme so much, but it's kind of, I think it, I'm kind of wearing it out here. Most of my internal stuff has this in it, and I've got to stop. All right, so let's look at, uh, and both of these are, are real-world scenarios, but they're sort of an amalgamation. Of course, we don't share direct customer investigation stuff. It's not cool, but the, we see these, these are very general uh, incidents, and you'll see that they're um, very applicable to pretty much any scenario. Uh, so I'm going to try to give you as much information as I can to be helpful, but obviously not too much. All right. So the first thing, there's not an accident that there's day one, day two, and day three here listed. That's only 48 hours. So we're seeing a really, really short dwell time. Our last M trend showed closer to like a 90-day dwell time, which wasn't really that much different than the year before for your, your basic compromises. Uh, for cloud, this stuff moves really fast. And a, lot, a large part of that is that the attacker can leverage all the same things that uh, an admin can, because they're basically a rogue admin at that point. So think about this. If you're red teaming cloud, you can set up everything exactly how it's going to be in a customer environment in your own cloud account and know that it's going to be 100% the same to some level. You might have to do some discovery uh, to say, okay, which, you know, enumerate all subnets. But let's think about that. If you're on-prem, you do an Nmap or something like that to, to map out the network. If you're lucky, you can hack into AD. That'll tell you you know, where everything is. But if you have API access to a cloud, you just say, where is everything? And it gives it to you in a programmatic fashion. And suddenly what should have taken days now took seconds. And so that's a big reason why attackers can move so much more quickly on cloud. And the uh, homogeneity of the environments is also a big part of this because once they get this down and attack one place, they can turn around and reuse almost all of that uh, to any other victim because there is so much that's similar between the two. All right. So specifically, in our scenario here, uh, using those methods we talked about earlier, we have stolen credentials. Uh, they come in, they perform recon. That's on day one. Uh, on day two, they're going to dump uh, the data through API calls and set up the environment for XFIL. And this, generally speaking, the, the reason why this doesn't happen all in a single day is that uh, advanced adversaries are switching the keyboard out. So they have uh, people specifically that know how to get in in the first place, they know how to steal the credentials, and then they have their cloud specialist, they'll come in and say, okay, I'll take it from here, I know this individual cloud provider. It's this real bizarro world where you have rogue administrators that have uh, specialties, and that's honestly the, the thing that's slowing the attackers down the most is their resourcing, trying to figure out who the best person at that time, who's on shift if it's nation state, uh, all those kinds of things, or you know, even if they're just you know, uh, crimeware style, um, they're still going to have to have their buddy come in and help them out in something because they're not experts in everything. 
And so that, that the keyboard changing hands is usually where you're going to see the most delay in what's going on. Otherwise, it would be one giant long script, and the whole thing would be done in a minute. And you know, hopefully we're not there too soon, because there are still a number of manual things that have to happen. But that could, you know, we could get to that point. So there's some specific API calls that will happen uh, to dump. And we've seen a number of these. Uh, the big one that we see that's kind of interesting, because it's nothing particularly malicious, but very rare, are snapshots. So ask yourself uh, how, much, how many controls you have around like a, a really important database. Maybe it has financial information in it. You'd have really st uh, strict network controls over it. You'd have logins that are really specific for it that are hard to get to. You don't have that if you boot up a box and mount the snapshot from that other box on this other box. Now suddenly it's your box and you don't have to worry about the network and it's your box you don't have to worry about the login. All those things go away. So Cloud lets you sidestep a lot of those things. And if you're not paying attention, then that can happen. Now this isn't to say that, oh, the cloud is just inherently insecure, because there are permissions that go with those snapshots, right? If you do it correctly, then no one's supposed to have permission to log in in the first place. No one's supposed to have permission to mount that snapshot. So it's not this is a mountable problem, but if you're not trained on this kind of stuff, then that's where this will lead to. So they, they mount the snapshot, and then minutes later, uh, they're dumping all the data. All right, so that sounds pretty bad. Uh, what are our opportunities for detection here? Uh, it's worth noting here that none of these are going to be, you know, oh, this is a giant red flag. If you see this, then came over, we found them. All these are what we call weak signals. These are, you know, if you're hunting, these might be good. But generally speaking, these are not worth an alert to the SOC. It's only in combination of all these things that you're going to have an alert. So logging from a new IP address may not be a big deal. Maybe somebody moved. Maybe they're at Starbucks. You don't, you know, depending on your policy, that may be, you know, complete uh, no news at all. New user agent, same thing. I mean, that's... They, you know, any new browser version will change the user agent, right? So that happens frequently. Not a lot there. Uh, but if you can combine those, it starts to get a little bit interesting, but we're certainly not bothering the SOC yet. So maybe between day two and day three, uh, this is where you have enough to go on. But again, when we look at the time frame here, you're expecting your SOC to be able to correlate stuff across a 24-hour time period, and now you're just looking at even more weak signals. So you have, you know, API calls that don't happen very often. Well, define very often, right? Totally depends. It requires a lot of domain knowledge. Again, can you do this domain knowledge across every cloud provider? Probably not. I encourage you to focus on one cloud provider and get good at it. Uh, new kind of API activity. So understanding exactly what those calls are, and then down to the asset level, uh, this requires more uh, things like uh, flow logs between them. All right, so the, there's a lot of different things you could do to secure cloud. And when you st first start out and you don't have anybody do any production workloads, you probably feel, you guys have all seen this, right, like a million times. So I could just kind of refer to it because these pictures are terrible. So Mr. Burns is, you know, walking in. They go through like eight different uh, secure doors. And I always feel that way when I'm, you know, hitting my two-factor authentication for the 90th time that day, you know. And you know that your secret thing, you could, like, especially with, um, you know, sort of, not necessarily a bank, but, you know, a car rental company or something like that. And they go through all this effort to have all these different things. And then you know that if you just call up the person and ask nicely, they'll change your password. <laughs> and so it's one of those scenarios in cloud where you have all these things in front. So you have the two-factor to get in. Uh, and then the second anybody tries to actually get some work done there, they're like, yeah, it'd be a lot easier if I just did this. No different than on-prem. Humans are humans, whether they're in the cloud, whether they're on-prem. That kind of stuff still happens. And so the second you guys start trying to actually get work done in the cloud, then you end up with the screen door with the stray dog running around next to the keys to the kingdom, right? All right, so uh, this one came in. Um, I had about three or four incidents uh, over the last, uh, well, I don't want to go into it. <laughs> Some time period that I'm amalgamating here. Um, but it, it was a great example, and uh, I, had to, I had to show you guys. So. First one, I mean, come on, really, you got a dev server, nobody, you know, it hasn't been patched, it hasn't gone through QA or whatever, but it's out on the public internet because it's much easier to just do all zeros, right? Same, same thing. Now, normally, you'd have, uh, on-prem, you'd have to go through, like, 10 different tickets to get somebody to open a port, right? Because you have these really tried and true processes. In cloud, often what you have, is, even if it's not shadow IT, even if it's, like, legitimate, you know, sanctioned activity within IT, you still have, and this is actually overall a good thing, but we have to have developers, I call it democratizing data, where, because in previous roles in Fire, I've been an engineer where I'm just trying to get work done and we want to move quickly, and getting ops out of the way is, is helpful if you don't screw it up, right? 
And so there's generally a lag in process uh, for cloud because you don't have these age-old on-prem scenarios. And, and yet, uh, log logically you do. So if you accidentally open up a, a port, uh, that can be really bad news because you're really get, doing experimental stuff uh, on cloud because no one else will give you a box on-prem or, or whatever. All right, so that's fail number one. Uh, fail number two, not understanding the difference between usernames and roles. Uh, it's a lot harder to screw this up now than it was maybe a year ago, but we still see it all the time. So developers thinking in terms of on-prem, so thinking usernames and passwords, and I need a user that has access to this, kind of LDAP style, uh, like they would in AD. Really, it should be all about roles. So when a box starts up, we call it an instance role, as in you have granted permissions to the box inherently, and it's, it's ingrained into the box. It's not using a credential per se. Uh, there's, and, and it's even difficult to explain just in a sentence. There's a lot of nuance in there, but basically there's a right way and a wrong way. And at no point, and this should be pretty obvious, should a box that doesn't need the privilege have it, right? But it's always easier to over-privilege. And so now this box has an admin role uh, as it's booted up, and it's not even the proper role. Okay, so that's double face palm. We get to the triple face palm uh, when now we have a public bucket. This is like the, the one cloud security thing that everybody knows is don't have a public bucket. Still happens. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for it. Uh, often sharing data between partners is the biggest one because you don't exactly know who you're going to email to give a credential to or something like that. So it, it just organically happens. And uh, both Amazon and Azure have gone to great lengths to try to notify you when this is happening. And it's still not going to help because when you set up the public bucket, you probably are intentionally setting up a public bucket because there's nothing in there yet. And you're like, I'm just going to drop this one file in there. It's going to be great. Yeah, it doesn't go great, um, but it's an age-old security problem. Uh, it's especially bad when the developer thinks, well, when this script starts up, it needs credentials. I'll just store the credentials in a config file, and I'll put that config file in S3. OK, now we have a real problem. All right, so what will happen? Uh, so the attacker comes in. They, they notice their server because they can get into this box. That's bad. The dead box has way more access than it should. And so happens, uh, they have to get out of this without much of a problem, except that the, some of the data in the database that they were able to SQL inject into referred to an S3 bucket. So they were able to discover this S3 bucket that they normally wouldn't know about. Um, fun fact, you can enumerate S3 buckets using DNS. So you can pretty much enumerate them as fast as you want, because every bucket has a unique DNS entry. So if you find out that there's a prefix that a company is using, you can start going through there. Uh, it's another great using, reason to use uh, templates. Uh, for instance, CloudFormation templates will automatically append a giant random string to the end of everything, which will completely save your bacon in that scenario, because it would take uh, you know, thousands of years to, be able to do enough DNS queries to find that. But if you just go in and you're manually naming stuff, then you're going to end up with you know, a very predictable bucket name, which can be discovered, all those things. So pen testers out there, uh, DNS script, you know, parallelize all that, and you can start uh, doing some bucket scanning. All right, well, they didn't have to do that uh, because that was somehow in the database. Uh, that was unfortunate. And what was super unfortunate was that even though uh, they didn't get the, the database to give them straight uh, credentials, the S3 contained a file that had the credentials and this leads to uh, step five, bonus subnet. This happens all the time. Uh, so if you think of why criminals are stealing usernames, passwords, bank accounts, they're trying to take knowledge and convert it into money. This skips an entire step. Why go to all that bother? Just Bitcoin mine. You get the credentials, spin up as many boxes as possible. If you're nice, you'll use spot instances because they're nice and cheap and you can get even more out of it. And if you are a pretty big customer, that means your uh, cloud customer, uh, your TAM is probably going to call you and say, uh, did you mean to spin up 10,000 boxes last night? Because that seems like a lot. You don't normally do that. Uh, that's if you're lucky. Most places don't have an account big enough to have a person who actually watches for this. And this is where instance limits really uh, pays off uh, in general. Because if you're just starting out, you probably have a limit of like 100 or so boxes. But if you are a personal developer and you're just trying to get going, you're going to have a bad time at the end of the month when that billing statement comes through, because that's going to be the first time you notice that I think it's like 100 boxes by, by default for a personal account. Uh, that's, that's a lot of money. And if you're a medium-sized business, it's going to be way more than 100 boxes, and it's going to be a significant amount of money. 
and this works. So the, and it's really hard on the cloud provider side. I remember Joanna's comment, well, the cloud provider shouldn't have any access to my code. I don't want them to know about it. They aren't, and they don't. And the reason I know that is they have no idea the difference between an overloaded database and a Bitcoin miner. That's basically proof to me that they are not snooping on this stuff. Because um, otherwise, they would just say, oh, yeah, anytime Bitcoin starts up, then we're going to notify you. They don't do that right now. They have no idea what's running on your boxes because that's your business. Uh, in this case, that would be really helpful to know. It'd be nice to know that a new box is spun up. And if you think, well, I'm going to prevent that by running an endpoint agent on there. Well, no, you're not. They're going to spin up their own agent, right? They're going to spin up their own box. They're not going to use the golden image that you've created that has all your endpoint stuff on there. Not going to happen. So there's really not a whole lot you can do to prevent it other than watching the API calls uh, very carefully and having really good visibility into what's going on. All right, so how are we going to detect that? Well, uh, some of the basic stuff. Uh, hopefully, you can alert any time uh, in any any ACL is created. It probably has that on prem. You can certainly do that with cloud. It's really easy. Uh, same thing when a public bucket is created. Again, uh, at least Amazon, I'm pretty sure Azure has a thing for this too, will basically put a big red flag on any public bucket. But again, the developer probably wanted it to be public because they didn't think it was going to be a problem. Uh, you can have, an, but your security will know it's a problem. So you want to make sure that that information gets, you know, past the developer to security so that they can do something about it and start enforce policies. Uh, you're going to want to alert on an instance invoking a user control instead of a role. Talked about that a little bit. Gets pretty fine grained into the sort of IAM permissions and all that stuff, um, but it's it's easy to programmatically alert on uh, if you're in a position where you get access to the data, right? And that was kind of the first part is. Shadow IT, all those things can often make it hard to even get set up to do this. Uh, and then anytime you have a box that's being manually booted, that's a great one to at least take a look at. Now, that happens all the time. I mean, a developer, especially in your sandbox account or something, will spin something up, take a look at it, shut it down. That's how they do research, right? And so some of this is just legwork. Uh, I, was, I had a, a thought, just like wearing the, the crazy cloud jacket, of wearing the crazy cloud jacket and doing a little bit of a game show called Who Booted That Box? <laughs> And the more I played it out in my head, I'm like, this is not worth bothering people to come up and do because the answer is you can almost never tell who booted a box, and the answer is just always no. So I'd call up three people, and I'd say, who booted that box? They'd say, I don't know, and I'd say, oh, you lose again, have a seat. That's the show. Um, because nobody ever knows who booted the box. You have to call a guy or a gal and ask, why did you boot that box? And you would only do that if it already looked really fishy, which is kind of a hard thing to programmatically say. Um, but if you think back to that pyramid, the hope is that you can automate out all of the really basic stuff to get to the point where your SOC is actually understanding the development projects that are occurring to that level. They know developers that can at least access JIRA or whatever to figure out, should the person have done that? It's really weird what they're doing. Have a conversation so you get that sort of DevSecOps uh, rainbow unicorn stuff going on, which is difficult to pull off, but it's basically going to be required if you want this to work. All right, what about hunting? Um, so a few basic things. Uh, this should be fairly self-evident, but just calling them out specifically. Were there any, any new IPs that access this thing? Again, this assumes you're having your developers generally come in through one place. Uh, are there any objects that are coming out of S3? S3 object logging is, is actually pretty easy to do. It can be quite voluminous. Uh, so just like uh, Dave Kennedy was saying earlier, a lot of places don't want to do it if it gets to be too much. Uh, it's worth it. You should definitely turn it on. There might be one or two buckets that are so crazy busy you have to turn it off, but those are probably not the buckets that you're worried about. Generally, it's, it's these one-off buckets that you really need to know who's downloading what. Because I bet you if your SOC saw a file name come through that said, you know, admin credentials, they would probably ask some questions the developer didn't. And then back to the user agents and IPs. These are still, that for now, they're still valuable. It's worth looking at. There probably will be a day soon that they won't be very helpful. Uh, but it's at least, at least uh, worth taking a look at. All right, so how do, we, how do we get to this point where we still have all these problems? Uh, cloud's supposed to be awesome. It's not always awesome. Well, uh, that's because of how we get there. And I've talked to probably half of the Fortune 100 at this point on their, their cloud migration and, and how to secure that. Uh, at this point, I consider myself a cloud counselor versus you know, whatever my uh, CTO for cloud. Uh, and like I said, normally I have whiskey involved because it's a, it's a Difficult conversation as people think through this, well, how in the world is this going to work? Uh, so generally, with a lift and shift, which is uh, they have a garage sale moment where they decide, you know, is this coming with uh, yes or no? And that gives you uh, a little bit of savings. Companies usually say about 10% right there because they're just running less. 
because uh, they decided there was stuff they could consolidate or they wouldn't, wouldn't run. Uh, and this, from a security standpoint, this is not too bad because you're generally just taking literally everything you had on-prem and putting it up in the cloud. Same firewalls, same endpoint, all that stuff. Things mostly make sense, kind of a, you know, just a different name on the data center sort of thing. And yes, there are some API things you have to worry about, but it's not too bad. But the, you have a, that familiar security posture. Uh, the part where you get the most benefit as a company from is when you go, and I'm a huge serverless fan, for a lot of reasons, you could just get more work done faster that way. I, it's sometimes an unpopular opinion, depending on the room, but I've seen it, and it containers, all that stuff. You can go really fast. You can do it more securely if you do it right. Uh, there's a great reason to do it, but you have to learn the right way to do it. You have to invest. You have to train. You have to understand what you're doing, and that's where we run into problems because not only uh, is it hard for the developers to learn how to do it, or I should say hard, but they have to actually learn, uh, the other problem is that the security itself is entirely different. Who here has used uh, AWS Lambda before? <laughs> okay, a few. few. Uh, there's not really an IP address in, involved with Lambda. There's not really an operating system involved. Yes, underneath the hood, it turtles all the way down. I know, the cloud is somebody else's computer. But from a business standpoint, the cloud is not someone else's computer. It is a prompt where I type stuff and it runs. I don't care about the underlying stuff. That was the whole point. So while there technically is something running under the hood, for 99.9 .9 repeating percent of you, you don't care about it. There, as far as you're concerned, there is no operating system. As far as you're concerned, there is no IP address. And that means a lot of the things you count on for security in your day-to-day -day when you sit down in your chair in the sock, well, we have a lot less to go on now. Now it's all about logins. It's all about application logging. So now, again, we had, like I said you might have to call a developer. You might actually have to sit down with the developers and tell them they need to log more actually record what that app is doing so that there's something to audit because you're not going to have uh, a PCAP for what's going on because there's not a server. You're not going to have an endpoint agent that you can run. And you need to understand how you're, you're going to be able to secure that because there's still important criti mission critical stuff coming through this pipeline. It just doesn't have anything to do with all the, the tools that you're used to. And that's really uh, the big change. Uh, so t there was a great YouTube video about, I think it was two years ago, at the Chaos Computing Convention in Europe. Um, this this video is amazing. So this guy just showed basically this, how you can use the cron-like persistence. We've seen uh, attackers use for years now where a cron job will make sure that you know, all their backdoor stuff is still there. You can do the same thing with something like Lambda. So you can have a Lambda uh, run in a schedule. And so what you could do is create a Lambda that makes an API call to delete itself and then makes another API call that says, in 60 seconds, recreate myself. It's kind of cool. Uh, it's cute. Uh, but it actually works. And so what you have this is a situation where, as an admin, if you go to the console and say, something funky is going on. I want to look at all the lambdas. There won't be a lambda there. It doesn't exist from the admin console. And yet, it's running now, and it will run uh, basically forever. Uh, it's actually kind of hard to go and, and get. Uh, you might see it in uh, the law groups or something like that getting back to the audit trail, but you're not going to see it in the traditional sense. And so it's just a great example of sort of the, the new paradigm that as you go to cloud, you're going to have to learn. It's not hard. It's not too bad. Um, but it's just a different uh, surface area. All right. Uh, so I said I'd talk about Joanna again. Uh, so this one caught my eye. It was a forum post. And this just general IT admin could not, for the life of him, keep his HR recruiter's laptops from getting owned every single day. It was a re-image every morning. And, he, and you think about it, uh, and this happens in the legal world plenty, if your job is to take in unsolicited Word docs, you are in a really rough spot right now because there's, it's so easy to own people using macros and things like that that are still, uh, you know, AV is not catching this stuff. Uh, you're lucky if, if your email's catching it. And a lot of the time, this, thing, this goes through things like Newton or some other uh, recruiter uh, SaaS applications where you don't get direct access for your security tools onto these documents. And so you have all these unvetted Word docs and Excel spreadsheets and PDFs coming through, going directly to laptops in your organization and just completely owning them. And so this guy decided that he's going to, he was at his wit's end, so he's going to put them all on you know, the Cubes OS, which is getting a little bit more popular now, but it's still pretty esoteric for just a general IT admin to know about or care about. And that was the solution. He was like, I got to do something super drastic with this. Um, and it, so that really caught my eye. This is a big problem that, that we have. And this is kind of the pattern. So you have a CRM that doesn't have any instrumentation on it that you're used to, that you've mandated. 
but you don't really have a, you know, a say in this, right? As, as security admins, you can't tell them what recruiting software to use. They're going to use it. Um, maybe if they get owned enough, they'll, they'll decide they want to change, but there's not really that many to choose from. And it's not just recruiting software. There's, there's a lot of different kinds of variations on this. Um, but that's the general pattern that we see. All right, so what's next in cloud threats? Do on time here? Pretty good? All right. Uh, I do want to take questions at the end, by the way, so we'll make sure we save time. Uh, so on the confidentiality side uh, the, of the classic CIA triangle here, uh, data theft, that's the one that's in the news all the time. Like, this is obvious, right? Accessibility, this is a DDoS problem. Still in the news plenty, very understood. What about integrity? This one, I feel like it's forgotten quite a bit. Uh, so I did a workshop at RSA this year uh, where we did sort of a purple team thing, and we came in and we hacked some serverless stuff using basically parameter injection, nothing too fancy. Uh, but the, the sort of capture the flag element was uh, changing a data file. And I think the question that I'm posing here is, is about integrity. So how do you know if something has been changed but not deleted or not you know, put on the dark web? That's, that's the thing that keeps me up at night, is how do you know? And it's, you can expand this into election results, things like that. How do we monitor for the integrity of something like that when it's data and we don't really have like a checksum that says, well, this entire data set should have this checksum. That might work well for you know, one single researcher file. But if we say, how do we know that the entire corpus of all the transactions for today in this database are correct? I mean, you get into blockchain, some of those kinds of things, maybe that will help. Um, from an ML standpoint, this is where, I, I, in the workshop, we talked about this in, in a simple fraud use case. And there's a, an angle on this from a, the cloud security as well. So uh, the normal way you would do this is you have a big transactional database and you do a nightly CSV export or you know, something fancier than a CSV. And that becomes your source data and that gets over to the machine learning guys. And then they're going to put it through all the training data and all that stuff. Now, question number one, do you have the same security around that you know, transactional, super important banking database that you do all those CSV files that you just exported and then towed it all over the cloud? Are you tracking that with the same... Uh, same rigor, do you have the same controls over that? A lot of times you do, but a lot of times you don't, especially derivatives of that file might get sliced and diced and put it other places. But in any case, you have this legitimate source data that you're, you're hoping to protect, it gets turned into training data, it might go into something fancy like a neural net, and its job, we'll say in this case, is to detect fraudulent transactions, as in, it's really weird to transfer a million dollars into a Romanian bank account or something like that. Alert, block that, okay, makes sense. Well. So the, uh, the capture the flag part of the workshop was to basically add a few lines to the CSV that statistically made it normal to transfer a million dollars to Romania. And that was actually pretty easy, uh, at least conceptually, to do. So if you hack that source data, suddenly now you've hacked the application itself. And so understanding, again, this is why it goes back to app logic. How is the application working? So if you can get to some small piece of that, is that going to affect the integrity of the overall thing? All right, so how are we going to fight this overall with visibility? Uh, this is from uh, last year's Mandy and M-Trends. Hopefully you guys are reading the M-Trends here. We'll put a lot of work into it. There's a ton of good stuff in there. Uh, we put out a lot of stats, things like that. Uh, but my IR guys had, had my back from the, the, the cloud practice, and they are already talking about the importance of visibility. I didn't even have to ask them to put it in there. <laughs> that was their own, own recommendation, having responded to so many incidents in the cloud, uh, was that visibility is what it's going to take. And they were nice enough to give you a few self-tests. And I, I think that these are probably the most important, this is probably the most important slide in the whole thing. It's the least uh, exciting, but this is probably the most valuable because these are the litmus tests you can bring home and say, okay, is the answer yes. Now, for each one of these questions, I mean, have you operationalized it? As in, does the SOC do this on a daily basis? Is this normal? So can the organization see what files are being downloaded from a cloud-based storage site? It doesn't mean after you know you have an incident, can you go pull logs that would tell you that. It means if there was something weird coming through there, would you know about it before the FBI tells you about it? Are admin logins tracked and reviewed? Same story. Are these tracked and reviewed by SOC you know, regularly, every day, as in would less than 24 hours go by? Uh, what about unauthorized provisioning and cloud infrastructure? The Who Booted the Box game show starts right up here. Your SOC is the contestant every single day, and they're trying to answer that question. And that means DevSecOps bringing them into the fold for new projects early so they understand what's going on from, from that standpoint. They understand what's normal, what's not normal. 
And then what are you getting uh, from the cloud provider themselves that's going to help? And this is where the cloud provider specifics are so important. So whether you know, it's uh, VPC flow logs from Amazon or Azure Network Watcher flows, it takes a little bit to instrument that. And so being able to specialize is very helpful. A lot of us don't have that luxury, and you have to learn both. Uh, it's, it's worth it, or you know, Google Cloud or any of the others. Um, you need to do it. All right, so I break down visibility into different domains. Pretty, pretty straightforward, network endpoint and events. Events is basically the catch-all. This is kind of what it should look like when you talk about full monitoring. So we have uh, four main types of uh, cloud provider logs. We'll dive into that uh, in the next slide. Uh, and then just making sure that you have a good image for anything that boots in the clouds. And this is, uh, I get asked about container security a lot. The vast majority, having built stuff with containers for a long time, the vast majority of, of what you're running in containers, the containers need to talk to each other. So I've talked to like a ton of startups that have uh, really specific like firewalls between containers because they want like one container to affect another. But the vast majority of them, whether you're running Kubernetes or anything else, uh, those pods or whatever are supposed to be talking to each other. So that's, you're not going to get very far with the firewall part of it. What you need to remember is for if you're running a Linux-based container on a Linux-based host, it's going to show up like a normal process for the most part. There's some caveats in there. Uh, but that means that your you know, typical old endpoint agent is actually going to provide a bunch of security for your containers because they're running on the host. It's very different than a virtual machine situation. Now, big caveat, doesn't apply if you're crossing your operating systems with containers. Um, but if it's the same operating systems, Linux on Linux especially, then you can basically apply your, your host-based security and get pretty far. And a lot of places won't tell you that or you know, they, they try to make it more complicated. But basically do work with the hosts that are running the containers and be in pretty good shape. Uh, you can still get pretty good network visibility. It won't have all the tags for each you know, Docker container attached to it, but it'll still help. Uh, so endpoint's still critical. And then anything you get from on-prem to correlate that is still going to be really critical. So I tell a lot of people to make sure that you're monitoring the choke point. If you have a pretty uh, large cloud implementation, you might have paid for a direct connect. So that's like a dedicated gig link between like, your big data center and a, and a cloud provider. And that's a great choke point to put network visibility. You're going to want to monitor all that, especially the SMB traffic going there. And then all that's got to get back to one place because if you think about the last slide, we have to answer all those questions to answer them every day as efficiently as possible because we have other things to do. All right, so the four basic types here, and I, this might help some of you speak the language a little bit uh, to break it down between Amazon and Azure. So this is kind of the, the matrix here. Uh, for, for audit, in Amazon, it's going to be CloudTrail. In Azure, it's tenant activity logs. Uh, for operational stuff, and this is including app logs, uh, this is a big one. So it's CloudWatch in Amazon. It's activity logs or OMS in Azure. Um, and, and that's a big one. So especially with containers, by default on a place like Amazon, they will all log to CloudWatch. So as long as you can say, I'm getting all my CloudWatch into my centralized logging, you're good. And so when a dev spins up a new container app, you're going to get all those application logs. You're going to have a fighting chance. So really important to make sure that that is the standard for the environment. You're not doing anything weird. Um, and actually, this is my, my one pitch for saying maybe you want to think about something like uh, the native cloud service for like uh, ECS versus Kubernetes. Now, you can run both on a place like Amazon. The security benefit to using something like ECS is that by default, everything will go into CloudWatch. And so you only have to do that one time. If you do the Kubernetes route, then you have to make sure that every single dev says they're going to put their logs in a centralized place, which means some of them won't. Uh, so that's, that's my consideration when you guys are doing this planning. Uh, think about it from that standpoint. Native will be more secure for sure. Uh, and then lastly, uh, and you'll probably see more announcements uh, from the cloud uh, providers uh, themselves, but Guard Duty and Security Center are, they're not really equivalent at all, but they're sort of in the same bucket. Um, those change like month to month, so I'm not even going to try to tell you, you know, what the level is, but understand that those are the security alerts that you're going to want to centralize. Uh, all right, so this is part of the overall layout, so generally you can have a few data centers, your branch office, all that stuff. Just make sure it's all coming back to one place. Um, and then I do want to talk a little bit about the, the SaaS stuff. So this, you know, and this is one of the hardest things that I find when I'm talking to customers. Cloud means like something to everybody, and it's almost never the same thing. When I talk about cloud, mostly it's from a public cloud provider because the other problems are either, you know, not interesting or unsolvable, but they're still problems. Uh, so if I, as like infrastructure as a service providers, uh, we're you know just renting boxes. Those are still totally cloud. Um, you have a lot 
you know, less to worry about there from the perspective of it's truly just a different data center. And, and it might be like just a tiny different API used to boot a box, but not really different than running VMware in your own data center, that kind of stuff. Um, but from SaaS, this is where, you, you know, everything changes. Um, SaaS is a totally new animal, and it, you know, obviously it completely depends on what the application is. So there's some big ones. Uh, they might have the most data in them, but the parade of apps that are coming through means that your job is never, ever done. Um, making sure that if you're using uh, a CASB, that those logs are being centralized and that are, they're reviewable, uh, just like the other stuff we talked about, that's critical. Uh, that's a, you know, it's basically the new firewall at this point, right? It's deciding who has access to Salesforce, who is, a, and when they're in Salesforce, what are they going to be able to do? There's a really bad trend that I see right now in the industry uh, where you have to pay more to get additional logging. This is one of the most dangerous things I'm seeing right now. With Salesforce, it's something called Shield. You have to pay extra to get the verbose logs. Uh, w with Azure, it's, it's pretty bad, too. They basically say, unless you're going to use our thing, um, which is like half of what you need, then you're going to have to pay a whole bunch of money to have uh, third party uh, looks at it. So if you want to dump that stuff into Elk or something like that, it's not as good as if you use their built-in thing, which doesn't do what you want it to do. And that's a trend that's very disturbing because you're not getting that full visibility into what's going on. And so that, depending on you know, which cloud you're talking about, I think you'll probably continue to see that. Because from, you know, if, you're, if you're writing a SaaS and you're selling it to people, you want to spend the least amount of time and infrastructure as possible. And extra logging might mean more time and infrastructure. And what's the immediate benefit? So unless we in the security community you know, make a lot of noise about that and say, well, we don't want to recommend anybody using your thing unless it's going to be secure. You have to prove it's secure by having proper visibility with logging then they're probably going to continue to you know, give you less and less to look at to the point where you might not even know if you can log in. Um, did you know that you have to buy uh, Azure Premium AD to even have the right to see when people log in? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I have some buddies at Microsoft that are equally annoyed by that. Um, and you know, in some ways, if you're a big company, you're probably buying E3 or E5 anyway, so generally that gets bundled in. But if, you're, if you have a development wing and you're doing a lot of SaaS, you don't want to do that. You want to start with the basic stuff because you probably didn't need most of that other stuff in the first place. And you just get into the situation where you don't have what you need to get your job done. And that's a bad trend. So I'm hoping that we can make enough noise to at least get people to give us the basics that we need to get our job done. My, my one call to action from all this. Um, so yeah, VDI is also in there too. I talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, and that's all, f all factors of that. Don't forget about it. All right, almost, time, almost question time here. So uh, final checklist, pretty simple. Phishing, 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 email, email, email. It's still, for everything, number one. Uh, endpoints and networks are still important. Even if they're on-prem, they can still be used to get into your cloud. And visibility into all the things, uh, so provider event logs, uh, files that are being transmitted through stuff that you don't control, Try to find a way to get control of it, or at least get a view into it. Uh, and then, of course, any SAS telemetry you can get. All right. Uh, so we still have a good amount of time here. I have a few giveaways. So for every question, we have some nice goodies here for you. Go ahead. Your choice. So ask questions early because you get the pick of the litter here. Ooh, good choice. I know that guy. He's awesome. Uh, <laughs> yeah, can you repeat the question? Sorry. <laughs> so, so we use Azure, um, yeah. and we have a challenge in security of keeping up with the changes. So we'll have something that, that was a preview feature. Now it becomes a standard feature. And all of a sudden, this thing can happen now, and you can log in from anywhere. Right, or right. Thanks. Like that. Okay, so the question is, how do you deal with uh, the continually changing uh, nature of specifically Azure? Which, uh, so, <laughs> I sound like such a Microsoft basher, and I'm trying not to, but I had that same experience. Um, so Azure is a great example of they're they're doing amazing things at Microsoft by cloudifying the company. Uh, kudos to them; they've done really great. Uh, but as part of that, almost everything that's not infrastructure as a service on Azure right now is basically preview. 
If they don't tell you it's preview, if you get on a tech support call, they'll tell you it's preview. I think Event Hub is about the only thing you can like legitimately use and be confident in. Uh, and then their APIs change all the time. So my, the answer is, uh, you know, lemonade or whiskey, whatever your drink of choice is, uh, it's not going to get better for a while. And part of that's good. You want that innovation. You want it to keep moving. But b basically, Microsoft is is behind enough, and they're throwing so much at moving fast that for many years they were good about documentation and things like that. That's not the case right now, at least for the next few months. Um, that, that's really unfortunate, because this is a critical time for us to secure things. As things are moving quickly, this is when errors are going to happen. New developers don't know what they're doing yet. New security staff don't know what they're doing yet. That's the hardest time. And I, there's not a good answer. You just have to be diligent and beat them up on it with your TAM. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, good question. Uh, how are you keeping up with the changes on new cloud offerings? Uh, it, it is an unwinnable game, so basically you try to find what the biggest impact is going to be to your business. And sometimes it's a really tough call to kind of Sophie's Choice it a little bit, where it's the, you know, I only have time to do one or the other. Uh, but really ask yourself from a sort of a threat model, who, uh, what is the worst that would happen for this particular thing? Right, and then look at the partitioning there. Yeah. Right. So when the upgrades happen, how are you going to find the new stuff? Uh, Twitter, honestly, to start with. Um, I mean, you'll see some security research come out of there, but I mean, yeah, any any bleeding edge new stuff, it, it's all it's the same game that you would play with anything else. It's just in a little faster cadence, so you stay on top of it. I mean, that's that's continuing education is critical as, as for any security research. All right, excellent. Uh, so the question is, wh what about PCAP on cloud? Would you use uh, things like the new virtual tap? Um, there's probably something like that coming out for Amazon soon, too, uh, where you have the ability to capture packets. Uh, there is some value in that, but not a whole lot. Almost everything that happens on cloud is totally HTTPS. Um, network flows are going to give you the vast majority of what you're looking for. The caveat there is, for most cloud providers right now, you can't get a solid log of DNS entries without uh, doing some, like, reading packets to extract that. So I would say bare minimum, you know, read port 53, and at least you'll have DNS names. Uh, but there's not a lot else you can do. Uh, so I'll leave at the same time. I'm so sorry. I'll go ahead here. Go ahead. Okay, how else could an S3 bucket be used maliciously aside from stealing? Well, there's the, uh, the integrity part that I talked about. So if you can alter a file, that might be really bad, depending on what the file is. Uh, but the other part is that you have a lot of bandwidth available to you when you're running in an S3 bucket, so hosting any malicious files would be super bad, uh, is just off the top of my head. Um, using any kind of steganography to hide really bad stuff would, as a drop point. Um, you can use, oh, uh, so in my workshop at RSA, how you can use uh, S3 to trigger a Lambda that would have bad parameters in it that would get code to execute. So the act of uploading an object to S3 uh, may actually execute code somewhere. So just simply writing a file or DOSing the amount of logging that comes out of that. So back to that visibility, you can make yourself invisible by DOSing the amount of logs coming through. Um, I think we still have, we still have five minutes, good. Uh, go ahead in the blue. DFIR in the cloud uh, recommendations. Uh, so a lot of that doesn't change. You're talking DFIR. So if you're doing uh, Im like getting images is actually a lot easier. Snapshots is, is um, super straightforward. So that's a, a big boon. Uh, oh. Uh, 
Oh, interesting. So would you recommend downloading it on-prem? No, I would say keep it there because the same read and write APIs that are handling the, the actual machine level byte stuff, whatever attacker came in and altered that, you know, the hard drive wherever it is in whatever data center had to go through that same API. So I think that you're going to be better off and, and certainly operationally from a SecOps perspective going to be better off keeping that cloud side. I don't think that there's a big advantage bringing that down on-prem unless you have a really specific reason for doing that. Uh, in fact, you can leverage a lot of the big data analytics and things like that to run 10 different analyzers on one giant disk image and spin up, you know, 100 boxes to do that in 10 minutes instead of 10 hours, right? So I would say leverage that. I don't think you're going to get anything by downloading it because you're still going to go back out the same APIs. So any kind of bytes that would have been altered some way, you're not going to get the raw hard drive uh, info anyway. Yeah, if it's an yeah exactly. If it's an active incident, then yeah, SecOps still is very important. So try to build a separate area for that. Uh, you can share images, which can get you in trouble <laughs> if you forget the permissions and don't set them up correctly, but you can certainly uh, share those across accounts so that you can have an IR account, essentially. At the very least, yep. Uh, they're in the gray. Okay, so you're asking, if you got as far as aggregating your data and got that step, what's the biggest mistake? Uh, the sin of omission is the biggest one, thinking you got everything and not getting everything because it is a daily challenge. Uh, that's the number, number one thing. Uh, building in heartbeats so that you know when you're dropping, uh, that's another big one. You may think that what you already set up is working, but you need to have a way, and someone whose responsibility is to say, if this asset is important for us to secure, that means we need to verify we're getting that that uh, heartbeat of telemetry, so we know if the logging stops. Uh, there's a lot of reasons that logging can stop. Someone might accidentally change a permission that allows that to happen. Uh, the box may die, it may boot up as a different box. Uh, all those things can happen. I didn't even talk about the ephemeral nature of the cloud, but that sh it should be fairly obvious. When, you, when you're talking about uh, DFIR, it gets a lot harder because you're talking about a moment in time, right? So again, back to that, even the IP addresses for servers versus serverless can of often be meaningless in auto-scaling groups where a box may exist for five minutes. Uh, all right, um, another question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, biggest blind spot in telemetry for uh, the public cloud providers. Uh, yeah, I used to say it was PCAP. Um, I think they are well on their way to fixing that now, and now that by the time they're getting there to fix that, I would say that's not even that big a deal anymore because what are you really gonna see? other than DNS. Uh, I think that it's really, if your developers are logging things to their app logs, you're going to be in good shape, but that requires them to do work. So really that's the biggest thing that I see missing is you get uh, box booted up, box shut down, whatever happens in the middle, who knows? Was it Bitcoin mining? That's on you. That's the, the um, shared responsibility model. Like whatever happened with that box when it was running, that's on you. So making sure that you are going out of your way to, as a, as a policy, as a security policy and practice, make sure that your devs are logging as much as possible so that you have some clue what's going on with those boxes. It's absolutely critical. Uh, but yeah, I think that the network telemetry is probably the bis, uh, biggest missing one. I would also say the sign-in logs, um, you know, whether it's Microsoft or Amazon, could have a lot more there. And that's why I had on that um, sort of ecosystem uh, chart that, on-prem is a part of this because coupling your on-prem logs with your cloud logs is usually the way that you get the full story there. All, all those great questions. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah. Oh. Slide before your before the slide, slide, sure. This one? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one I was talking about. So this is just pointing out that all these things play a role. Uh, wherever, wherever those assets are, they're still your assets and they're probably going to talk to your cloud stuff. And if you're only looking cloud side, you're probably only getting half the story. Just like if you're only looking on-prem, you're only getting half the story. All right. Oh, last one. Go ahead. Have you published anything that kind of is a CEO, CTO level on why you should focus on one cloud? Because I would really love to hear that advice. 
Uh, I can refer you to someone who has. Um, it's, it's one that I gave my own CEO. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there, there has been stuff published. It's right now very unpopular because almost everyone has no idea what they're doing, and so they just say cloud all the things and then hope for the best. Um, that's a terrible approach. I think it's demonstrably, provably a terrible approach. Uh, I will see if I can find that for you. Um, but yes, I would love to write that myself. It'll just come off as an angry rant to the editor if I do it right now. All right, thank you guys so much. I'll be in the hallway if you have any other questions. <laughs>